don't know if you've read many crime novels or watched many crime dramas on TV, but in our house, we've concluded that the key to solving these is, first of all, to look out for a minor character who's easily overlooked. They probably did it. And secondly, to spot what is a red herring, what's been thrown in there to, to throw you off the scent. Well, in John's Gospel, there are no red herrings. There are plenty of fish, but none of them are red herrings because John's gospel is carefully crafted to include only what John believes to be absolutely essential. He has chosen to present his biography of Jesus in terms of seven signs, eight if you include the resurrection, and these signs grow in intensity. And today we're going to be looking at sign number four, and this sign will lead us into the first I am statement of Jesus. I am statements are another feature of John's gospel, but more of that later. So why has John decided to present his biography this way, to use the signs? Well, he tells us why at the end of his gospel in chapter 20. Chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, John writes, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So John acknowledges that there were tons of other things that Jesus did that he could have included in his book, but he's just chosen these. Why has he chosen them? So that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So there's a process here. We are shown the signs of Jesus, the miracles he performed. They should point us to the identity of Jesus, who he is. That should lead us then to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, God's son. And eventually after that, that should bring us to life in Jesus. We need to go where the signs are pointing. Imagine if I'm driving into Gloucester and I want to find the cathedral. As I'm approaching the city, I see one of those brown signs that says Gloucester Cathedral this way. If I go and park my car next to that sign, have I found Gloucester Cathedral? No, I need to go where the sign is taking me. I need to follow it to my ultimate destination. And our ultimate destination, says John, is life, life in Jesus. That's where he wants to take us. And John is certain that these signs that he's chosen provide enough evidence for us to see that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and therefore to have life in his name. So, so far in John's gospel, Jesus has turned water into wine at a wedding. That was sign number one in chapter two. He's healed an official son long distance in chapter four. He's healed a paralyzed man by the pool in chapter five. And now in John chapter six, Jesus takes on a mass catering project. So let's read together from John chapter six and verse one. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing those who were ill. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Okay, remember that nothing in John's gospel is there by accident, like the fact that this takes place just before the annual Passover festival. Why is that significant? Well, it's kind of hard for us to understand the importance of Passover to the Jewish nation. It's the time of year when they remember God setting them free from their slavery in Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt with an incredible demonstration of his mighty power through the Red Sea on dry land and led them into the wilderness where he fed them with manna from heaven. So Passover is all about deliverance. It's about their leader, Moses. It's about a lamb, a sacrifice, an exodus, a manna in the wilderness. But the Passover wasn't just a spiritual festival. It was also a political and patriotic festival. It was their Freedom Day, their Independence Day, if you like. It really stirred up their sense of national identity. But it also stirs up their sense of injustice because at this point in their history, they are no longer free. They are oppressed once again, this time under Roman occupation. 
So celebrating their religious and national freedom while since under Roman rule creates a very tense atmosphere. It's hard to think of an equivalent for us. Imagine that the UK was invaded and occupied by a foreign power, which had been in charge for decades. What it would be like every year, say on Remembrance Day or VE Day, when we looked back and remembered a time in our history where we'd been victorious against another foe. Maybe it's hard for us to imagine, as we weren't occupied during World War II, but imagine if you were French or Polish or Belgian and you had known occupation, being delivered from it, then later on, you were occupied again by another nation. Those anniversaries of freedom in the past would have been even more poignant, even more intense. And into this world steps Jesus, teaching the people with such authority and performing these signs. And people stop believing that he might be the Messiah, the new Moses, the one who's going to set them free. In chapter three, we were introduced to two of the characters from today's passage. Andrew and Philip. Andrew had told his brother Simon, we have found the Messiah. And Philip had told Nathaniel, we found the one that Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So they have been convinced and have become disciples. And now, by the time we get to chapter six, Jesus has such a big crowd following him around that it's kind of hard for him to get any peace. So it's nearly Passover. Let's read what happens. From verse five. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to only have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. He was a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So we've got a crowd. Later on, we're told there were about 5,000 men. So with women and children, you're probably looking at at least 10,000 people. And Jesus asked Philip a question. Where should we buy bread for these people to eat? Bit of a weird question, isn't it? But John tells us that this question is a test of Philip's faith. OK, Philip, you said you believe that I'm the one that Moses wrote about. Do you think I can do anything about this situation? But Philip's faith isn't up to that yet, sadly. He's still at the stage where he sees the enormity of the problem rather than the enormity of Jesus. We haven't enough money to even buy for them to have a tiny bite, let alone a decent meal, he says. And then Andrew steps up and you wonder, don't you, if he perhaps has just a little bit of faith because he's found a boy with a packed lunch. Now, barley was the bread of the poor, so it's really not very much. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, says Andrew. Is he perhaps suggesting very tentatively that maybe Jesus could do something with this? Well, if he does have faith, it's very wobbly because as soon as he suggested it, he said, but how far will that go among so many? Yeah, it's a silly idea, Jesus. Forget I even said it. But Jesus already knows what he's going to do. Let's read from verse 10. Jesus said, make the people sit down. Sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Do you notice the contrast? Whereas the disciples think small and see problems, just a bite in verse seven, Jesus goes large as much as they wanted in verse 11. Let's have a look at what Jesus doesn't do, because that might help us to take in what he does do. He doesn't turn five loaves and two fish into 12 baskets of leftovers. That in itself would be amazing. And he doesn't 
pass round five loaves and two fish and say to everybody, just take a little bit, a bit like we do at communion sometimes, just take a crumb. And amazingly, it goes round 10,000 people and there's enough. That would be amazing too. No, Jesus does neither of those things. What he does is he feeds 10,000 people as much as they wanted. And then the leftovers are more than they started with. Maths with Jesus is crazy, isn't it? In school, I always tell children, if they're subtracting, then their answer should be smaller than the number they started with. If it's bigger, then they've made a mistake somewhere. Because it's, it's crazy, isn't it? But this, this isn't the case with Jesus. It turns out that Jesus can break the laws of maths as well as the laws of science. So we have here a picture of abundance. Notice well that they filled 12 baskets. It wasn't that 10 or 11 would have been enough because a couple of them were only half full. They were all full. So picture the scene, around 10,000 people, flat out, stomachs full, couldn't manage another mouthful. There's a painting, a modern rendition of this, where people are sitting around in the field with their packets of fish and chips open on the grass, being fed, having been fed. And you know that feeling when you've had fish and chips, you're absolutely full. A wonderful modern rendition of what it had been like in that scene on that hillside. I wonder when the penny dropped for people. When did they begin to see and hear the echoes of the Old Testament narrative of the Passover? Imagine you're one of the people in the crowd and you overhear this conversation if you're close enough between Jesus, Philip and Andrew. If you know your Old Testament, Jesus' question to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat, might remind you of a question that Moses asked God when the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness longing for something to eat. From Numbers chapter 11 and verse 13, this is Moses speaking to God. Moses says, where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. And Philip's reply, it would have taken, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite, might remind you of what Moses went on to say a few verses later. This is verse 22 of Numbers 11. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? Can you see the similarities between that conversation between Moses and God in Numbers and this conversation between Philip and Jesus? So you've got a crowd out in the middle of nowhere. It's Passover. There's a conversation about how on earth they're going to get enough food for all these people. And then there's bread miraculously provided. Well, it's not long before people start to work it out for themselves. From verse 14, back in John 6. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who came into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. The problem, Passover fever, is getting kind of taking over here and their patriotic zeal leads them to getting the wrong idea about Jesus. They think he's gonna give them a political victory over the Romans. It's a bit like they've misread the sign. They think it's pointing in one direction, but it's not. They're thinking this guy is the new Moses. This means he's gonna deliver us from the Romans. Well, Jesus is the new Moses, but he's so much more than that. He's way, way better than Moses. And the deliverance he's going to bring is far greater than a physical deliverance. He's going to set them free, set them and us free from sin itself. But Jesus knows what's in their minds. They, they want to make him king by force. And for the second time in this passage, John shows us that Jesus is in control of events. He will not be taken by force to be their king. So he withdraws from them. But what does this passage have to teach us today? Well, firstly, let's just take a moment to marvel again at the amazing power of Jesus and the miracle he performed. In our familiarity with the story, let's not 
skirt over it. It's incredible what Jesus does. What power, what supreme authority over um, the created order. But let's not just stop at the sign. That would be like parking at the sign for Gloucester Cathedral instead of going to our destination. Remember, the sign is there to reveal the identity of Jesus, that he's God's Messiah, so that we may believe in Jesus and have life in Jesus. What does that mean to have life in Jesus? Well, later on in his gospel, John says these words in chapter 17, verse 3. Jesus, Jesus, um, John records Jesus's words. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I wonder whether you've taken that step yourself to know Jesus, to know God, the only true God, to know Jesus, who God has sent. Have you taken that step? Have you seen the signs? Have you read about what Jesus has done? Do you believe that he's God's son? Have you asked him to come into your life to be your Lord and saviour so that you can have life in his name? If you've not, I would encourage you to find out more and to take that step for yourself. But what if we're already Christians? Is Jesus maybe asking us a similar question to one that he asked Philip? Is he asking us to face the crowds and to feed them? And as we look around our neighbourhood, our city, our world even, is Jesus asking us, where can we get bread for all these people to eat? It may be that Jesus is calling us to feed people physically. There are de definitely people, even in Gloucester, who will not have enough to eat today. And projects like the Holidays Activities and Food Initiative, the Food Bank, Gloucester City Mission, and all those sorts of things are working hard to try and feed those who are hungry in our society. Not to mention all the brilliant things that are going on in other parts of the world for whom daily hunger is a reality. But Jesus didn't just come to feed people physically, to send them home with lovely full stomachs, only for them to be hungry again later. No, further on in chapter six, Jesus tells his disciples this. In verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. That's the deepest need of every single one of us, to know the satisfaction of our deepest spiritual hunger met by a relationship with Jesus. And that's the deepest need of the crowd here in this account in John and the crowd out there today. And as we face the crowd, and see the enormity of the task before us. Do we answer Jesus a bit like Philip did? That's way too many people for us to feed, way too many people for us to reach with the gospel. It's too hard. Or do we answer like Andrew and say, well, it is hard, but we've started a kids club on a Wednesday and we've got a new youth club on a Friday, but that's not much, is it? We've distributed some leaflets around their local houses, but that's not much amongst so many, is it? Perhaps what we need to do, even though our efforts may seem small, is to put them in Jesus's hands, because it's only in his hands that they can grow. Did you notice what Jesus did when he was given the bread and the fish when they were placed in his hands? He gave thanks for them. He looked up to heaven and he thanked his heavenly father for the feeble offering. And it was only then that it was transformed into enough to meet the needs of the people. What an incredible thought that Jesus could thank his father for our feeble efforts, our feeble offerings. We may not know what to do, but our starting point must be to put our efforts into Jesus's hands, to put ourselves into Jesus's hands. We don't know what, what he'll do, but part of faith is trusting that he will do something and it will probably be something we hadn't thought of. So what is Jesus looking for in us? He's looking for faith. You know, those wristbands you can get with WWJD on them. What would Jesus do? Well, I wonder if we should change that to what will Jesus do? 
What has he got up his sleeve, his very, very big sleeve, that he wants us to get involved in? Is Jesus perhaps testing us like he tested Philip? Do we see the enormity of the task, but fail to see the all-sufficiency of Jesus? We could classify Philip as a pessimist and Andrew was an optimist. And we can have a discussion about whether we are by temperament more, pe temperament or more pessimistic or more optimistic. Are we more glass half, half empty people or glass half full people? And some of us would know quite quickly which of those two camps we fall into. Or maybe some of us might say, ah, I'm not a pessimist or an optimist, I'm a realist. And that's fine. But what is our realism based on? If it's based on the reality of the power of Jesus, then that's great. But if it's not, then we're probably more pessimistic than we realise. There's a song by Doug Hawley that has these lines. Faith as small as a mustard seed can move mountains by the power of God. Believe what Jesus said was true. Believe he meant it just for you. Wait and see what God will do when you pray. I love that line. Wait and see what God will do when you pray. Let's be those people who bring our feeble efforts and gifts to Jesus, who bring ourselves to Jesus. Place them into his hands and wait and see what he will do with them. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are full of surprises, that you surprised your disciples, you surprised the crowds, and today you still surprise us with what you do in our lives. We thank you that you want us to be involved in your plans and your purposes, and you want us to place ourselves and our offerings and our gifts, small as they be, into your hands. That you thank your Father for them, and then you take them and use them for your glory. Help us, Lord, to have more faith, more trust in you, to believe what you said was true, and to wait and see what you will do when we pray. So, Lord, help us to think bigger rather than small. Help us to see what you're doing and get involved, to see what Jesus will do in our church, in our city, and in our world. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.